Now, on the immediate side, I've always been obsessed with cleanliness. Maybe it's part of a you know a family thing for me, right? Um, so, I um, I'm in some ways it feels like things should have been clean and sterilized from day one. You know, you, you hear United Airlines, you hear hear of all these hotel chains who are pledging like you know world class cleaning. Uh, well, that that should be the standard. Yeah. It, it shouldn't have suddenly been, you know, raised. Maybe it's a marketing thing, <laughs> but I don't think it is a marketing thing. You know, uh, I'm sure many people have experienced. You you don't get your late checkout anymore at the hotel because literally the cleaners have to spend hours and hours cleaning things, sanitizing things. Um, but this part of it, right, um, where there's a lot more uh, s- expenditure on cleaning supplies. I mean, for any of the listeners who are stock traders, you know, a popular trade used to be, uh, uh, what was it, Kleenex or Clorox, uh, the, uh, yeah. you, you know, the, the tissue company and, and uh, other companies. Great, great trades because, you know, a lot of demand for that. But that, that demand is going to wane over time, obviously. Um, are, are you seeing, in, in, you know, let's talk a bit about Mero too because you're, you're in the sector where you're tracking and, and reducing waste. Um, often... A cleaner comes and will throw out, you know, a toilet roll, for example, right? Just because that's process, and they don't, you know, that's just standard policy. But if there's still some, you know, supplies available, why throw it away? Why not reuse it? We're, we're living in a world where sustainability is more important. Talk to us about sustainability of supplies and, and tracking, and uh, what's going to happen through through COVID and beyond. Yeah, so I think um, it, it's easy to, to think about something as simple as a toilet roll or, or a paper towel roll and, and think it's not significant um, for the operations of a lot of these buildings. But what, what we've really predicated ourselves on is um, you know things like that which are providing everyday value um, in, in the property. Um, I mean, the, the, just to talk simply, the tenant experience now of having no soap or no tissues or, or things like that to sanitize your hands or to even um, you know use the restroom is is no longer going to be acceptable. Um, but there, like you said, there is that that major balance of um, the cleaning companies now dealing with tighter budgets and needing to spend more time actually cleaning, not just checking on dispensers. Um, there's no real um, solution for them right now that exists. Um, their routine is is not going to be the same as it used to because, as we said, um, different areas of the building are going to be occupied at different rates throughout the course of the day or throughout the course of the weeks. And those cleaners have no insight into that. Um, you know, before this, as we said, 97% occupancy was the, was the rate of uh, occupancy in Toronto. Um, that's going to be uh, what people are thinking down to around 30 to 40% on any, any given day, but could rise to above 50% or 60% on, on a busy day with the new um, sort of flexible work arrangements. Um, so that sort of dynamic, um, that, that, that dynamic um, occupancy is going to be net met by something that we are going to call dynamic cleaning. So let's, um, and that let's, uh, di- yeah. l- 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 let's dive into that a bit more. What, what you're saying, a big shift you're seeing is that you had stable occupancy. It was sort of easy to predict. Uh, and there wasn't a need to predict occupancy. I mean, it was 97%. Utilization of, of buildings and how they're used is changing now to be more dynamic. That's okay. going to wreak havoc across you know supply chains for, for cleaning materials and consumables. Um, so w- what you're predicting is that the concept of occupancy is going to change. You're going to have varying levels of occupancy throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What's the significance of that? It's it's really just being able to forecast and predict um, very high spends such as cleaning labor and cleaning consumables. Um, it's it's really kind of usher what you know to your earlier point. It's ushering in sort of this new feature of of utilizing the proper building data in real time, um, and using that to influence your decision making. Not some spreadsheet that was made in in the nineteen nineties that that still just happened to work in up till twenty nineteen. Um, that was kind of the way that it was done all the way um, up until a year ago, um, and and now it's it's really I think you know kind of lit up a, a light bulb for a lot of these property owners to, to start to say, hey, maybe there's some inefficiencies within um, these contracts. Um, we haven't felt the squeeze as we have up until now with our, our rentals to really make it um, make a change with some of these inefficiencies. Um, but now I think is, is really the time. So there's a whole surge in interest around workplace uh, occupancy analytics 
or, or I would say real-time occupancy or real-time data around occupancy, there's many various approaches. There's approaches where you have sensors on a desk or a meeting room. You've got approaches where you've got a camera and they use computer vision technology to sort of detect movement of people. And then you've got Wi-Fi based approaches. Okay. Um, what's going to stick? Yeah, so for us, what our, our hypothesis or thesis is, is the hardware um, is not the important part about what goes into the building. It's really the data that is produced. Um, so having extremely um, high price points on hardware in order to roll out what we think is fairly simple data, all you need at the end of the day um, for, for most property managers is an occupancy rate um, and, and the total number of occupants, say, in a, in a specific room. And from there, all of the data um, is, is really based on that. Um, and add into that the, the consumable side, and that's kind of like your immediate ROI. As you said, reducing some of the wastages and, and just reducing some of the time that the cleaners are spending checking on these restrooms, that gets you your quick ROI on a low investment of hardware. Um, that's really our thesis into the market is, you know, this simple peel and stick device, um, very, very low or no hardware cost. Um, and able to be realized that return on investment much, much, even that much faster um, means the product's going to be quite literally sticky. Uh, and, and that's a, a play on what, uh, what our sensors essentially are as peel and stick devices. So what you're really saying is that in the future, buildings will be smart. And in order to be smart, you need occupancy data. What you said, though, is that you need actual occupancy data to a room level. Is that granular enough? Can you deduce just by the number of people in a certain room or total number of people in a building, can you with that get enough data around the likelihood that you know supplies will be used and also all the other things needed to power smart buildings? Smart buildings here could mean you know buildings that are more efficient with how they use energy, like your yep. air conditioning systems. What, what do you think is needed? Do, do we need to go down to the desk level or is the room level sufficient? So our perspective on the market is that there's going to be many different, there's many different verticals within the commercial building that it takes a, uh, an entire company in order to master. We've chosen the cleaning and the hygiene vertical. Um, so drilling right into the consumables and drilling into um, the occupancy as, as sort of a, an additional to that, we're able to um, give enough information that's granular enough for the cleaning staff to make a decision on whether, they, on whether or not they need to clean the building and soon whether or not the supplier needs to top up that building with, with more consumables and being able just to communicate on that vertical. I think there will be other complementary companies that will exist in the HVAC vertical or other complementary companies that will exist even on the desk occupancy vertical. But it takes an entire company to do that and then there will be um, a way that all of you know, us companies or us microservices can, can collaborate across uh, the entire smart building. Um, I think that's going to be the future of, of these buildings and, and that uh, is starting to get, so that picture is starting to get painted. Your, your yeah. success, and I like the term you're using here, microservices. These microservices are, are disrupting boring areas of prop tech, really, you know, I mean, yeah. cleaning and HVAC, things we take for granted, right? You need infrastructure. You need access okay. to data so you can uh, evolve your offering to the next level. Yes, exactly. And, and to do that, we'll, we'll, it'll need to be a cohesive ecosystem um, where, where all of the you know, data providers are working across in, in unison um, for the benefit of you know, this, um, you know, really what is a smart building. You can, add, you can add sensors and your building's still not smart. Um, it's, in my opinion, it's not smart until you have many different systems working with one another. Um, and and prop tech in and of itself, um, as as you know, the the takeoff has been been slower than we've expected. I think largely because of this, you know, this strategy is still being developed, and over the past year or so, we've really started to see it um, take a big step forward. So when we look at the different market segments within prop tech, you went for the cleaning vertical. Now here's the thing with real estate: it's it's quite boring at times. But that's what makes it so exciting and interesting. It's so boring. It's been so slow to adopt innovation. Cleaning of all places, my God. I mean, you know, that, that, that's not the most... Uh, any entrepreneur likes the idea of building the next Facebook, the next Tesla, right? You're here, you're building the next uh, company to help make cleaning more efficient. Um, talk to us about the cleaning vertical. It's, it's, it's a big market, I assume, but could you quantify it for us? How big is this market? And, and what's the significance of, uh, you know, the upside for companies to work with Mero, what, what, what are the savings? 
Yeah, so it's it's about a seven to eight billion dollar market in the United States, um, but it's really been marked by margins of less than a percent at sometimes. One percent. Um, we know of one company percent. that had, wow. correct. Yeah, one percent profit margins. So extremely razor thin margins, and and that's just the the nature of labor based industries. Um, and I think when you take a step back and from a macro perspective, what is technology really helping humans do is it's to improve or reduce the amount of labor that they have to do in a lot of these instances. Cleaning is just one of those areas that has never really seen that attention. Um, I think people have tried to leap to the you know aut- automated scrubber or the robotic vacuums. Uh, and and yeah and, and it's a it's a bit of a leap because you know you need to clean between the nook and the cranny of of the sink and the mirror and and no robots able to do that at this point. Um, so and really, not what, to mention, what, the r- robots are a, a threat to the um, you know common w- w- worker here at the front line, well, and that's going to obviously encounter resistance. Exactly, exactly. So so what we're really set out to do is provide that supplement to the cleaner because even if you're a cleaner if you put yourselves in the shoes of a commercial cleaner they don't want to be spending that time doing monotonous work like checking in the restroom poking their head into the stall checking on the dispenser they would rather be doing things that are valuable and and that are useful to to the building and especially nowadays um, those sanitizations those are all the more critical um, so we're just helping the cleaning staff be um, the most useful and, and most valuable to the property and in the end, of course, that's that's a benefit to the property because they're getting um, all of the benefits of that as well. So in a world where you're, you succeed with your vision, what does the future of cleaning look like? And what's yeah, the direct so a, impact to the owners of real estate and the consumers? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I think the, the key word here is transparency. Uh, we're creating transparency in a place where it's never existed before between the property and their cleaning contractors between the property and their suppliers and distributors we're going to create the place that shows the real-time actual usage of supplies and the performance metrics of those cleaners so that the property can get the best experience what's going to result from all that is improved um, cleaning performance. Um, So cleaners are going to be able to have less times where supplies run empty and a tenant finds an empty soap dispenser or an empty toilet paper roll right down to the bottom of it. The tenant is going to be able to bring up their application, their tenant app, which they have all of their um, building microservices on and be able to check if the nearest washroom has been cleaned in the past hour. Um, They're going to be able to understand whether or not um, the soap dispenser or the, or the Purell hand sanitizer around the corner is going to have soap before they even get there. Um, that's really the, the picture that we're trying to paint here. Um, and, and just like you, we're, we're um, kind of uh, very meticulous when it comes to cleaning. And, and we want to make sure that that's a, a reality that people can continue to, to sustain in the future. Nathan, the example you cite sounds so obvious. I've been to restaurants and I've gone to the toilet and I've seen a piece of paper, a timesheet that marks how often the restaurant toilet room has been cleaned. And this is, by the way, a process. Believe it or not, this is what companies call cutting edge process. You know, we have timesheets. We ensure that cleaning happens every X hours or whatever. Useless, I'm in there and, and like, there's no supplies. I mean, what the hell, I can't use the toilet for God's sakes, right? Um, so it's such an obvious problem. Uh, as a consumer, you, you experience the pain when you reference an example like that. And then you think to yourself, well, there must be a better way of doing it. And so you, your idea is to use sensors to track the supplies and to measure the, you know, to, to improve that aspect where you're not just doing a random shift. You're more intelligently dispatching cleaners to locations based on when supplies are running low. Does that capture the essence of what you're trying to achieve? Yep, that, that definitely captures the, the, the core essence and, and the first product that we have in the market. Um, and, and I think as we scale, as, as I said, we're really moving upwards into the market. Um, so once that product's out there in the field, your supplier will immediately understand if you're in low on inventory and without even needing to send a sales rep out to the building, they can uh, dispatch out and, and send a new shipment of supplies. Um, from there, obviously, the property wants to expand their kind of breadth of suppliers that they work with. So the more and more of these suppliers that start to work with more buildings, you start to create a, a commercial marketplace. And, and what we are um, you know, kind of politely calling the, the Amazon for commercial, kind of democratizing the access for commercial properties 
to these simple products like paper towels and soaps and toilet papers because you don't shouldn't have to be only buying product from um, the supplier that happens to be about a 20 minute drive away you should be getting the best product for your you know equipment in the building um, that fits your budget and, and can essentially fit what the, the needs are for the building. Well, what percentage of cost goes to cleaning for uh, your average uh, building? And you might want to sort of clarify what the average building is. Sure. Um, so for, for a, a mid to large size building, about a, a 30 to 40 story office building, the cleaning labor spend is anywhere between 1 million to 1.5 million. And the consumable spend is probably anywhere from 300 to 400 K. Um, consumables being paper towels, toilet papers, soaps, garbage bin liners, um, things of that sort. Um, we've predicted the, the inefficiencies of cleaning um, are probably somewhere between 20 to 30 percent um, and the inefficiencies in, in actual supply usage are, are between 30 and 40 percent. So that means about 30 and 40 percent of supplies are wasted of that consumable spend. Um, so for every single building across a property manager's, property manager's portfolio, they could be wasting anywhere between 100 to 200 K. Um, so that's millions across the portfolio and even millions more in, in the cleaning labor spend. Um, obviously, you know, that, that being said, there, there's a lot more to be gained within, within those numbers. And the numbers you mentioned, what is that typically as a percentage of total uh, op OPEX? We find, yeah, we, we find the cleaning and um, cleaning and consumables um, anywhere between 10 to 15%, which is the second largest OPEX item next to the heating and, and HVAC.